and Luke chapter 11. I preached this down at uh, the street preaching thing that I was a part of in early May, and then over at Hope about two weeks ago, I preached this over there, and it was like the Lord said, you had not done that here for a long time. So we am going to do it. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 50. 49, sorry, Luke 9, verse 49. Just two verses there, and then chapter 11. There's two conversations here. Two different conversations between uh, the Lord and certain folks. Luke 9, verse 49. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. Jesus, and Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Okay, in other words, you don't have to agree with us 100%. Let's try the chapter 11 one. Luke 11, verse 14. Okay, this one goes, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the devil spake, and the people wondered. And some of them said he casted out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Okay, Beelzebub means the lord of the flies. And others, tempting him, sought, him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, the idea there is, uh, if Beelzebub or the Lord of the Flies, where flies, mosquitoes, stuff like that, portray unclean spirits, and we have the, he has the power here in verse 20, with the finger of God. In other words, the fly is there and you flick it off with your finger. Or you catch it and take the wings off and then watch it walk around. Okay, so that's the power of God. Verse 21, when a strong man armed to keep with his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. And then here's the statement. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, compare the statement in 23... He that is not with me is against me. Verses 9. He that is not against us is for us. One statement says you don't have to agree with him 100%. The other statement says you do. Which one's right? Okay, so let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea. Help us to be faithful to your words. Help us to recognize... The truth of this idea and help us to be faithful to your task in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you go back to analyze each of those passages, one case he's dealing with a man. Okay, there was a man casting out devils. So with the man, the individual, he says, he that is not against me is with for me. And the other in chapter 11 is dealing with spirits, unclean spirits. Okay, with man, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. With spirits, 9 out of 10 is bad. 8 out of 10 is bad. 7 out of 10 is bad. 1 out of 10 is bad. Okay, one is dealing with man, flesh and blood, and the other is dealing with spirits. In John 1, 14, it says the word was made flesh, referring to Jesus. And then it says about Jesus Christ, he is full of Grace and truth. It says that twice. Grace and truth. Now, those are opposites. Okay, liberals would say they're on the grace side. Conservatives say they're on the truth side. Liberals say 
people are more important. Principles on a conservative side, principles are more important than people. Okay, so you have two sides, grace and truth. Grace is being gracious with people. Truth is being dogmatic, strict, okay, uh, according to the words of God. So where is the balance in that? Okay, in Mark, in, uh, in the Luke 9 passage, with people, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. On the spirit side, you don't want that. You want 0 out of 10. Okay, now in some sports, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. Okay, in basketball. Okay, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. I don't know if you guys shoot free throws, but that's where you get your shot down pat at free throws. Usually if I play, I like to shoot at least 10, but if I can get up to more than that, that's better because you're concentrating your shot. And a guy who's a good shooter, he may be having a bad game, but when he walks to the free throw line, you're going to see about 9 out of 10 going in. Why? Because he's focusing. Now, if you watch me real close when I do my free throws, I'll be adjusting the basketball because there's a magnet in there. <laughs> okay, and so I had that magnet set perfect last Wednesday because 130 of those went in a row. 130, when I shot my 100. I usually shoot 100. If I shoot 100, I like 90, 96 is okay. 97 is better. 98 is better. 99 is better. 100 is the best. Okay, but in high school, 7 out of 10 was pretty good. Okay, and if you shoot free throws in basketball, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. Now, the funny thing is, is I get the same score I do in basketball that I do in bowling. Now, 9 out of 10 in bowling is, is bad. I mean, that's when you got the kitty bumper things. Okay? But in basketball, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. So with people, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. If we got 10 beliefs and 9 of them we're in agreement with, what's the fuss? Okay? But with spirits, you don't want any agreement. Unclean spirits. That's the Luke 11 passage. And the, the one in Luke 9 is dealing with people. Now, I'll give you two basic reactions. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. Okay? And so, the first reaction we should have is a gracious reaction toward people in the matters of knowledge or ideas. Where 9 out of 10 ain't bad. 8 out of 10 ain't bad. In baseball, if you hit 4 out of 10, you're going to Hall of Fame in baseball. Okay, but in beliefs, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. Okay, now the Baptists, you know, tend to think, a lot of times they think they tend to think they're, they got the hold on truth, but I've discovered they don't. Now, as far as doctrine goes, biblical doctrines, rightly divided in the Word of God, I will, my general source for that are Bible-believing, and a lot of them are Baptists, if not the majority of them, but Bible-believing, but if you look at the Bible believers as a general group across this country, I go to them for doctrine, biblical doctrine, but for family ideas, how to raise a family, how to have a, try to have a good family, I ain't going to them. Because a lot of them in shambles. It's like they drug, drink, drug them up, you know, bring them up, you know, and go to this, do that, and there's really not a lot of guidance. I'm speaking generally. I learned a lot of good family principles from a fellow named Bill Gothard. Okay, uh, you get a lot of good things. Oh, the Baptists, they don't like that. He's not local church. They're fussing about that one area they don't like. But they had good music. And they had good principles for the family. So that's where I got it from them. Mike Pearl's got some very good things for the family. Some of the Bible, oh, I don't like him. Why? Nine out of ten ain't bad, my friend. Okay, in, um, in health, physical health. Okay, uh, you know, I'm really not a big fan about going to medical doctors. I'm not saying you should go to them, but I don't see that they're real successful because they admit they're practicing medicine. I would like to see people who perfect health. One fellow I like to read is a guy named Norman Walker. He lived to be 119. Paul Bragg lived to be 94. He was surfing in Hawaii at the time, fell off the surfboard, hit the, you know, his head, killed him. And he wasn't surfing with a wheelchair. It wasn't handicap accessible. I'd say that guy knew what he's talking about. I learned a lot of health principles from a Mormon named uh, Dr. Christopher. Uh, he taught a guy named Dr. Schultz, who is a, who's a real heathen in morality and life. 
But he does know the body. He does know how to fix the body. I was milling some wood for my log home and a log snapped back and caught my finger right here. It clipped off the end of my finger right here, right under the fingernail. You know, I, I'm trying to be like my dad. You know, he cut off this much. I didn't do all the way. But uh, I cut off the end of that. Whoa! So I went over to Brent and Jen's house. It was just 100 yards away. I said, get some cayenne. I put cayenne all over my finger. Held it up. Okay, stopped bleeding. Went back to cutting wood. No, no, no uh, infection. It cauterized it perfectly. Stopped the bleeding. Cayenne, uh, settle your uh, blood pressure. Stop a heart attack. Take care of a stroke. Cayenne's wonderful. It makes you forget everything, that's for sure. As soon as you put it in your mouth. I used to cut the trees in the wintertime. It was cold out. I'd take a cayenne capsule and pop it in. I was warm all day long. Take the coat off. I mean, no problems there. But I learned that from those health guys. A lot of the health stuff you learn, they may be a little new agey in some of their beliefs, but you can get rid of that and take the good part. You see, uh, if I have mental troubles, emotional troubles, am I going to go to the psychiatry world? Not me. Maybe you are, but I'm not because that's the number one profession of suicide. That don't sound real successful to me. They're dealing with a spiritual aspect of people, but they're kicking the Bible out. What I'm saying is nine out of ten and bad. I've learned about American law, the laws of America. A lot of people don't understand the laws of America. I learned that from a converted Lutheran. Went to his funeral. And the pastor of the church said that he's in heaven because he got baptized. And I thought, I know he didn't believe that. But that's who I learned it from. I learned about the uh, financial money uh, deals of America. When you understand how money is created out of thin air and everything's just a facade, you know, uh, all these things are just created out of thin air. I learned that from British Israelites. They think that they're shifted to Israel. I mean, they're goofed up on that. But they sure did understand the money issue, and I learned a lot from those things. I learned archaeology in Israel from a Seventh-day Adventist, a guy named Ron Wyatt. He was a King James man, but he, uh, he was confused about uh, Calvinism, Arminianism. He thought Christians were going into the tribulation. And, but yeah, he was pretty solid on the King James issue, and he would, he would cite a verse, and he'd ask me where it was, and I'd give him chapter and verse. And so we took a like, he took a liking to me. And when we were in Israel, he asked if I would do a talk about the King James Bible on the uh, tour bus that we had. So it happened to land on Thanksgiving Day, 1997, which happened to be my 40th birthday. So here I'm traveling in a bus from Jerusalem down to the Red Sea crossing site down in there. For about 45 minutes, I talked about the, uh, the preservation of the perfect word of God. Now, of the 30 some people that were on that uh, tour... Four of them liked it. Myself, my son, Ron Wyatt, and the Jewish guide. They avoided me. Everybody else avoided me after that. I thought, you know, maybe I didn't take a shower or something. But I sure didn't enjoy it. As soon as I got done, Ron Wyatt said, please tell them about the tribulation. Because he thought he's going to the tribulation. I'm not worried about that. And he was a 70-year-old man. I'm not going to change his belief, especially right then on the spot. And I just said, I said, Ron, I think I gave enough info right now. Why? Because 9 out of 10 ain't bad. 9 out of 10 ain't bad. In music, Bob Jones University has a good music program. Pensacola Christian School has a good music program. I wouldn't go to them for Bible department, but I'd go to them for that. Uh, in science, Ken Ham has some good information. Kent Hovind's got some good information. They got some wrong information, but they got a lot of good information. 9 out of 10 ain't bad. I'm not going to fuss with them about that other area. We had a fellow a few years ago, he was a former Muslim, claimed he was a former terrorist, I don't know, he claimed he threw a bomb at a bank and didn't go off, I really don't know. And he taught us about geography in Israel. He's a new King James guy. I gave him my Bible and he asked if I teach from this book, am I going to hell? I said, nah, you can do what you want. And today he's, almost, he's, today he's kind of defending Mariolatry in the Catholic Church. But I still learned some things from them. Okay, I learned about spiritual warfare from, and some of us learn about spiritual warfare from, a former Catholic, witch, Satanist, Freemason, vampire, 
Mormon, and he got saved. Now that's quite a combo. That is quite a combination with that guy. Today he's doing a lot of Jewish stuff. Eh, that's his business. He is a little bit Jewish, I suppose. But I learned a lot from him. A lot from that man. And I appreciate what I learned from him. We've been taking self-defense classes and how to shoot right classes from a contemporary Christian. A good man. Good man. I'm not going to worry about all those other areas. If we want to discuss it, we'll talk about it. If not, hey, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. And what do we do? We rely on the Spirit of God because John chapter 16, verse 13 says that the Spirit of God will guide you into all truth. When I was at uh, a college, Christian college, I heard the president of the school say one time in chapel, you should not read heretical material. And my thought was, how am I going to know if I don't read it? Who's going to be my Baptist Pope to tell me what to read and not to read? Oh, I'm so glad that the news media tells us what to think. I appreciate their concern for me. Yeah, right. I don't believe those people. Truth is truth no matter who says it. Even once in a while, the Pope might say something right. You know, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while, and a broken watch is right twice a day. And so, a lot of times you can learn from people of what not to do. I learned that in Colorado when I served under a fellow. I learned a lot of things about how not to do it. You know what Jesus said to the apostles in Matthew 23, 3? He said, do what the Pharisees say, but don't do what they do. Well, who are the Pharisees? You want to take that all to the limit? Jesus said to the Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil. Is that literal? They were children of Satan, yet walking around as men where people couldn't tell if they were a man or what they were. Judas Iscariot was. Jesus said Judas Iscariot was a devil. He didn't say he was like the devil. He said Judas Iscariot is, was a devil. A walking, talking devil, but people didn't know it. He walked around like a man. That's what the Pharisees were. In, in the Old Testament, the last good king of Israel or Judah was a guy named Josiah. Good friends with Jeremiah. He was the last good king. And toward the end of his life, God wanted Josiah not to do something. And he sent a man to tell Josiah by the word of the Lord. But you know, the man that he sent him was a wicked man, was not a Jewish man, was not a saved man, if you want to call it that. And Josiah rejected the words from this man because the standard operating procedure for people is to believe something from somebody they like and not believe it from somebody they don't like. That's the standard operating procedure. If your mind is set toward the truth, if you are a sincere seeker of the truth, some folks don't like that up front. What do we want? Insincere people to show up? Go kid somebody else. If you're a sincere seeker of the truth, the Spirit of God will guide you because you have the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error side by side. And you take a level unto the wall and see if it's straight or not. What's our level? You put the level on the wall. You see, and that's how you can check it. Or you use a plumb bob. When I built a log house, a level doesn't work because the logs taper about every 10 feet. So you've got to use a plumb bob, put it straight down the log. And a plumb bob's hanging from heaven... You get the picture? Coming straight down. Pretty as could be. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 40, after Judah was conquered by Babylon, there's a guy named Nebuzar Adon. What a name. It's a name you don't want to name your boy. He was a Babylonian. He wasn't an Israelite. He wasn't into Judaism. But he knew why God destroyed Judah, and the people in Judah didn't know why. They were victims. Oh, I can't believe this happened to me. You see, the thing is, is God can use anybody to speak the truth. And God can use, or and the devil can use any of us to speak error. Within minutes. Within minutes. In other words, with people, I would dare say we want to we wanna be recognized that 9 out of 10 ain't bad. With people. Okay? If a person has his mind really set on truth, and you understand that... <clears throat> Okay, this speaker, if a speaker knows that, it humbles him because he recognizes 
that personality is not the issue. Why did you come here? Hopefully to hear what this book says, not to hear what I say. So that keeps me humble, but it keeps you humble. And if you don't like the speaker, but you're willing to accept the truth, even though you don't like the speaker, that keeps you and I humble in that fashion. And that's what, the, that's what pleases God. You see, and the thing is, is nine out of ten ain't bad. Now, what's the standard operating procedure when people find out they get a disagreement? Yell, argue, back and forth, we're going to fix this contention, right? That's usually the standard operating procedure. Only by pride cometh contention, Proverbs 13.10 says. And a guy says, well, I'm righteously defending the truth. Yeah, I know. You're getting all mad about, well, it's righteous anger. No, I'd say it's self-righteous anger. Because it says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteous God in James chapter 1, verse 20. My dad and my brother was at a farm show, and they were talking to a guy. They got talking about some Bible issues, and this guy got all mad. Oh, we're trying to get his truth across. And dad stopped and said, hey, why would I want you what you got? Look at you. Should have gave him some cayenne pepper right at the time. It would have took his blood pressure down. You know? You know when emotions are high, intelligence is low? When you get discussion, something. Why not when we have... We do have a disagreement. People say, well, you expect people to agree with you 100%? I don't agree with me 100%. If you agree with me 100%, you're brain dead. We all have some variations. Nine out of ten ain't bad. Eight out of ten ain't bad when it comes to people. Why is that? Why is it like that? It's because the Bible portrays thoughts, ideas, Doctrines, belief as food. Jesus said in Matthew 4, he said, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In Proverbs 8, the Bible is portrayed as fruit. In 1 Corinthians 3, the Bible is portrayed as meat. In Psalm 19, the Bible is portrayed as honey and honeycomb. So the Bible, like here's food for thought. The Bible likens ideas to food. In the book of Job, three times it says about the mouth as the mouth tastes meat. So the ears try words. So that's how the Bible likens belief. So why don't we look at it that way? So if you go to somebody's house and they have a 10 course meal. T-bone steak. Hormone free. Grass fed. Last 90 days on corn. <laughs> I mean, or whatever. <laughs> and then you got some baked potato and a sweet potato and some green beans and some broccoli. And a nice big salad. We got to get that salad sprinkled with uh, a liquid aminos and some olive oil on top of it and some superfood sprinkled all over top of it. And some nice bread. And you gripe about one area you don't like. Isn't that what people do? If somebody did that at our house, I'd probably take the food and jam it in their face. <laughs> Where's your gratitude? What about the other? I can't believe you like broccoli. Well, I know it don't taste the greatest, but it's good for you. I mean, why is it that people say, well, I don't agree with so-and-so? Well, put it on a card. We'll give it to somebody who cares. I don't care. This is how people are behaving. Nine out of ten ain't bad. Now, when it gets to some of these beliefs, you know, the standard reaction is, well, that preacher said this. He's a heretic. He's lost. He's going to hell. Did you know that Sam Gipp's going to hell? Does everybody know that? Yeah, there's guys on the Internet. Sam Gipp's going to hell. He's a demon. Why? Because he doesn't spell Israel the way this guy spells it. This guy spells Israel C-H-U-R-C-H, and Sam spells it, the way the Bible spells it. And since he disagrees with him, Sam's a devil. That's the standard operating procedure. Why can't you just say, I don't agree with that? There's so many good things that he says. Nine out of ten ain't bad with people. You see, now, where, do you, where does a person draw the line? Does that mean I just give in to everything that somebody says? You know, okay, I agree. No, no, that's not the issue. Okay, if a person and I are sitting there chatting about something and he brings up a topic and it's something I don't agree with, we might discuss it. 
I'll give my viewpoint according to my conscience. For example, we was in uh, Sydney, Australia, doing some street preaching. And a Muslim guy came up. He's my age. Uh, young. Uh, so he's my age, whatever. Below 60. And uh, he kind of sort of respected what we were doing. And so he told me he's a Muslim. I said, okay. I said, I wasn't raised Muslim. Could I ask you some questions about your faith? He said, yeah. I said, do you call Muhammad the prophet? He said, yeah. I said, does prophet mean foretelling the future? He said, yes. I said, okay, can you give me one of his prophecies? He said, no. I said, see, in my conscience, I can't accept your belief because he's not even a prophet. I can give you a bunch for Jesus Christ, but you can't even give one for Muhammad. Why do you call him a prophet when he didn't prophesy? I don't get that. See, I didn't blame him. I took it on my conscience. And then he came back because he was a little sort of kind of embarrassed. Well, if you get to Quran and read that in the original languages. And I said, okay, is that Arabic? He said, yeah. I said, have you done that? He said, no. Then why would I do what you haven't done? It don't make sense. So all I did was ask them questions. And I'm not going to accept it because my conscience says that is not logical. The thing is, is there's times you can withdraw from somebody. If they're of the attitude, if you don't take my ball, I'm going to take it home and leave. Leave. Don't matter to me. Where I draw the line is if a person can't leave it alone. Come on, it's only one area we have a disagreement. And you always want to bring this up. I've got more fish to fry or bake. Depends when you do it. Okay, I, I got more important things to do. I've listened to your arguments. I don't really pay. I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, ring true to my conscience. You're not, you haven't persuaded me. So let's just drop it. Okay, let's drop it. Well, I'm not going to drop it. Well, then I'm leaving. I got more important things to do. You see, the Bible says you withdraw from some people. The Bible says, mark them which cause events, offenses and avoid them. Now, I'm not going to go yell and scream at them. I'm just going to say, I, can, I got more important things to do. Okay, especially when I've exposed you. Now, where do we actually have to draw the line? It's when they're demanding you to agree with them and promote their idea. When that demand is, is demanded of me, then I'm just going to flat out and say, nope, it is absolutely unscriptural, and here's why. And if you don't like it, I don't care. You see, why? Because even God himself doesn't demand you and I to agree with him. Surprise, surprise, huh? If you would, look in Psalm 81. Psalm 81. In the Bible, you'll see that men will just lay out the truth and then let the truth do its work. People accept it. Wonderful. People don't accept it. Give them time. Psalm 81. This is the Lord God under the Old Testament. He is addressing the people of Israel. He says this in verse 8. Psalm 81, 8. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall be no strange God, there shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. I'll bless you. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. And Israel had walked in my ways. He wished they did. It would have been better for them if they did. But he didn't demand it. The Lord Jesus even is even more skeptical of our age. Revelation 3.20 in the Laodicean age. Did you read that? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. He don't even expect him to hear his voice in this age. If. If they do hear my voice, I will come into him, will sup with him, and he with me. We'll have great fellowship. You see? God and the, Jesus don't demand agreement. Now, I think you're foolish if you don't agree. But that's your choice. Now, 
When you're discussing with somebody, something with somebody, there's times that you can give up a battle in a war. I deal with a JW a while back. And he mentions that when a person goes to hell, they, they go to hell and they like that. And it's like uh, a person would go, fall into the steel, you know, molten steel up there, the steel mills, and they, they're gone like that. And that's what he said hell is like. And I don't agree with it, but I, who cares? I said, isn't that bad enough? Who cares about the battle? I, was, I had bigger game there. Okay, isn't that bad enough? And he had to admit, yeah. And then I shifted it right to Jesus Christ because that's the issue. Forget all this little stuff. We have a fellow down to Rensselaer Church. He comes every once in a while. He believes in soul sleeping. So he thinks when he dies, he's going to become Rip Van Winkle. I don't care. I believe... 2 Corinthians says, when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. I mean, as fast as I'm out of this body, my soul's gone. I'm with Jesus Christ. Now, if a guy doesn't want to believe that, I don't care. Why? Either way, if you're sleeping, you're still going to be there quick anyway, because time flies, flies when you're sleeping. I believe that's an Old Testament doctrine. It's not soul sleep. It's a physical body sleep. But I'm not going to fuss about it. Okay? There's a big argument amongst Bible believers. Three and a half years, seven years, tribulation. Which one is it going to be? Churches have split over this. I had a young man sit in my living room and he asked, where's your position on three and a half and seven years? I said, I don't care. He goes, oh, okay. I don't think either one's right. I think it's less than seven years. About 2,300 days, to be exact. Possibly. Might be. But who cares? I know some that think that Christians are going into the tribulation. I tell them, have a good time. If you're right, I'll figure it out when the Antichrist shows up. If I'm right, you are going to be pleasantly surprised. And I'm certain I'm right on that because it can't be the church in the tribulation because he's going back to Israel. But again, if I'm wrong, if I've misread that, I'll figure it out. I've got the guns, I've got the food stuff, so I know where to run. <laughs> I didn't buy a house in Jordan, though. No, you got to get a house over there in Petra in order to get a house over there. <laughs> well, I'm not expecting that. <laughs> okay, sometimes you just kind of look at the argument or the discussion and take the non-essentials and put it to the side. And what's the real essential? You'll discover the real essential is final authority. That's the bottom line of every issue, final authority. I had a fellow down at Rensselaer Tuck, is a Iroquois Valley Christian Church. Uh, the pastor wanted to talk to me about the King James Bible. So uh, he, he came to church, just he and I, and I tape recorded and set it right in front of him. And I was very gentle with him because it's he and I, because that's how you deal with people. When it's just one-on-one, -on -one, be very gentle, ask questions, be very kind and gracious to him. And I put so many things out there that he said, I never heard that before. I never heard that. He said, I don't know about that. I wrestled with that. I wrestled with that. And I said, man, you should do a lot of wrestling. And he wasn't a sumo wrestler. He was trying to get that way. But uh, uh, I said, you do a lot of wrestling. And I said, well, 2 Peter chapter 3 says some people wrestle with the scriptures to their own destruction. I said, I sure hope you're not wrestling like that. He goes, well, I hope so too. <laughs> well, okay, uh, after three hours, you know, I said my piece. And, you know, he went his way. I went my way. A couple weeks go by, and he called me up. He said, I'd like to talk to you one more time. So I did. So I went over two hours. And after two hours, he said, I don't care what you say. I'm sticking with my NIV. I said, okay, that's fine. I don't care. And then he wanted to debate about other things. I said, hey, I get, I get other things to do. You are your own final authority. You have proved that to me. Because I pushed him. One, I, one time I really used my words and got him to admit something. I said, here's what you believe. You believe that everybody's got to come to you because you know the Greek and Hebrew. And you are the only one to understand the real scripture, right? And he said, yeah. I said, thanks for the honesty. Well, I got a book written right here, and they can go to this book without me. And so after that, I just said, I'm leaving. I'm taking off. There's no use talking about water baptism. Forget it. You are your own final authority. Your opinion. Everybody's got opinions. Everybody's got armpits. And they usually both stink. So I'm out of here. See, why? Final authority's bottom line. 
Okay, and now that leads us into our second reaction. Okay, and this one's going to be a lot shorter. <laughs> second reaction. What is our reaction towards spirits, unclean spirits? Okay, we're around them all the time. People just don't recognize it. Okay, and there's spiritism all over the place. And it's like flies and mosquitoes. And the thing is, is when we get around that and we recognize it. And you watch people's eyes and you can start recognize it. You study their eyes because the eyes are the windows to the soul. And when you start seeing a passive behavior, you're dealing with something, you're dealing with spirits. Sometimes you'll see the eyes glass over and they've not smoked any weed. I mean, it'd be that quick. And sometimes that thing will manifest itself real quick and then sometimes it'll, it'll go down real quick. And so when you deal with spirits, as Jesus said, if they're not for you, they're against you. There is zero cooperation. Now, in the area of this, number one is the Bible, the pure word of God. There is no compromise on that issue. The pure word of God. Now, I can sit down with anybody and discuss Bible issues, and I'm going to make this statement. The Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. I don't, I don't show my hand and say the King James Bible. I say the Bible. Why? Because when I say the Bible, I'm referring to a particular book. If you tell your kids when you walk out the door, you should go to the car, go to the car. I think you mean a specific car, right? If he gets in a wrong car and they say, hey, get out of there, wrong car. The Bible is a particular book, is, that means present tense. If somebody agrees with that statement, the Bible is the final authority of all matters of faith and practice, I don't got a problem. Now, if we get in a discussion, they start backpedaling, then some hypocrisy is going to be made manifest. And I am going to have a good time doing it. Because the Bible is a final authority. There is no compromise on that. Second area is my conscience. There is no compromise on my conscience. I want my conscience to be pure. I want my conscience to be clean, to be right with God. I want to keep it guilty as much as I can. <laughs> okay, why? Because you want to keep a pure conscience. You can sear your conscience. How do you do that? By accepting error when your conscience said that's wrong. And my conscience, I want to keep pure. And that's when you get into spiritual warfare where you make sure the spirit's cleaned out from spirits and everything. And I'm not dealing with witchcraft and all that stuff, but there's part of that. That's part of it. But I want a pure conscience, what I want. Keep my conscience pure and ask the Lord to help me keep it pure. The third area is music. Now, in this music, in this church, we will not have a contemporary service as long as I'm here. Not going to happen. Bring any young people. Don't care. Okay? They need to come up to the scriptures. Okay? Why? The contemporary music may have Christian words, but they've got unclean spirits pushing it. It's like eating a T-bone steak out of a garbage can. Okay? The music is the spiritual aspect. This is why people get so emotional about music. Well, I just like it. You know, Elvis saying, how great thou art. I could care less what Elvis would do. He died a dope head. And as soon as he died, the media said he didn't die from drugs. He died from drugs because he was a dopehead. And he got a start in a church. And then, he, and then he defiled his conscience by the music. You see, so our music is very, very, you got to be very cautious on music. When a person gets into their music, you've heard sometime, I'm getting into it. They are uniting their spirit with the composer and the, and the, uh, and the ones uh, singing the song, the performers. They're uniting one in spirit with them, and it's bringing spirits. And that's what's happening. That's why Satan was the original one of the music, where music, remember when David played the harp, it repelled unclean spirits? And you can have certain music that draws unclean spirits. And so a person, if you don't understand about music, you may not know what the right music is, but you certainly, your flesh can tell you what's wrong music. Okay, and the thing is, is music is a very powerful thing. 
And music is going to be what the devil will use to unite the world. And I know you what kind of music it's going to be. It's going to have an African beat. And that's going to be the uniting the world because that's the lowest common denominator. And the last area, there's no compromise, is the gospel of the grace of God. Here's the good news we like to tell people. You can be a friend of God by coming to Jesus Christ. By grace, no H2O. Can you imagine that somebody thinks H2O has got something to do with heaven? The majority of professing Christians thinks H2O, my H2O, my specially blessed H2O, is going to get you to go to heaven. Some of it's so good you only have to sprinkle of it. Some of it you really got to dunk them all the way in. There's just not, they must have some fluoride in there or something, chlorine. Okay, no. The pure gospel, the grace of God, eternal life is only found in Jesus Christ alone by grace through faith. The first time you were born, your mother did everything to give birth to the child. The child was given life as a free gift. So the second verse has to be the same. Jesus Christ suffered. He died. He went in the jaws of death. He was buried. He rose again. And he gives eternal life to anyone who who comes to him by faith. It's a free gift. There's not, nothing better than that. There's no compromise on that. If a guy wants to throw in his confession, his repentance, his baptism, his good work, no compromise on that. You have tainted the gospel. It's all tainted. It's full and free. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, there's a way you can know. Why did God give us this book? B-I-B-L-E. You know what it stands for? B-I-B-L-E. Be informed before leaving earth. My daughter-in-law is flying up from Panama right now. Should be landing in Chicago about an hour or so. When she got on that airplane, I doubt she asked the pilot, but I'm sure the pilot knew where it was going. Would anybody go to the airport, get on an airplane, and then ask the pilot, where's the flight going? He said, I don't know. Would you get off the flight? I just really like to fly. <laughs> Of course I'm going to get off the flight. If he don't know where it's going, why is it that the majority of people go to church and they ask the preacher, do you know where you're going when he dies? And he said, no. Why even stick around? How about going where they know where they're going when they die because it's full and free in Jesus Christ? Ain't nothing better than that. The ticket to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it's given out by faith. Grace through faith. There is no compromise on that. And that decision is yours and yours alone. I can't decide it for you. John Calvin can't decide it for you. That's your decision, yours alone. And that's where you got to have 100% agreement with Jesus Christ. 100%. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 100% on that issue. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us recognize that with people, we should have grace with people. 9 out of 10 ain't bad. 8 out of 10 ain't bad. Lord, help us have grace and help us if we there's disagreements that we could be mature about it. Sincerely discuss it. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to see that. But Lord, more important than that is even our agreement with thee. By chance, if somebody in here is not saved, they don't know for sure they're going to heaven. Help them to see that there's an opportunity they have by believing in thee and thee alone. And you will give them eternal life. And they will start on a road anew to become a friend of God. At that moment, they become a child of God, but now they can become his friend. Lord, I pray by chance if somebody in this room is not for sure they're going to heaven, they're not sure they're born again, they're not sure they're saved, they don't even know what that means, that they would see their need of that. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. If you're not certain of that, obviously, we can help you with that. By an uplifted hand, you're saying, Preacher, would you pray for me? I am not certain that I'm going to heaven. But I want to believe in Jesus Christ. Anybody in here, you're not certain of that? If you're too embarrassed about that, ask 
somebody else here. We love to tell you that. Please don't be embarrassed about that. We love to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ because that's where the joy is at. Jesus Christ first. Piano play. The altar's open. If you'd like to use it, it's open for you. With people, with people, people in our church, nine out of ten ain't bad. Well, you don't know what they did. Nine out of ten ain't bad. Well, I don't agree. Nine out of ten ain't bad. Well, it's heresy. Well, it's on their head. It's not on yours. Don't, don't worry about it. Nine out of ten ain't bad with people. But with the devils or spirits, zero out of ten is the goal. Zero out of ten. Lord, I do pray you'd help us recognize these different reactions that we can have towards people and toward uh, the unseen world. I pray you'd help us be faithful to your task. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.